everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Advancing with Amy, Mental Health Warrior and NeuroSpicy Mama. I'm your host, Amy, and today we have a truly special guest joining us, someone who embodies the spirit of resilience and creativity. Join me as we dive into the colorful world of Juliana Coughlin, a marathon runner, registered dietitian, and a passionate advocate for neurodiversity. From navigating the bustling streets of Tokyo with the help of Google Maps, to managing daily life with ADHD, anxiety, and OCD, Juliana shares her unique journey and invaluable tips on thriving in a neurotypical world. We'll chat about her fascinating adventures in Japan, including a magical tour of the Harry Potter studio. Plus, we get the lowdown on her quirky love for the advanced toilets of Tokyo. Heated seats, anyone? and her practical strategies for staying organized and on top of her game. And guess what? Juliana's not just about running shoes and marathons. She's also a huge Harry Potter fan and co-host of the nerdy yet entertaining podcast Into the Fold with her buddy Jeff. She's here to sprinkle some magic into our lives and remind us why kindness goes a long way. So grab your favorite beverage, get comfy, and let's get this conversation rolling with the wonderful Juliana Coughlin. Yes. Hello, friends. I'm Juliana. I'll just start with I live on Cape Cod. So anyone who knows like Martha's Vineyard, Boston, kind of in that general area. By day, I actually manage a running shoe store, which is a newer career path for me. I was and still am a dietitian by trade. I do that on the side now. I work with actually kids who are developmentally disabled or delayed, and I do meal planning and prep with them, which is a fun time. And I also have a pit bull named Myrtle. I am a very avid marathon runner. I actually just ran the Tokyo Marathon about two weeks ago now. And I also am a really big Harry Potter fan. I'm a huge book nerd. And I also have two of my own. Well, I have one of my own podcasts now, but I guest on a lot of other podcasts and things such as that, too. But generally speaking, Julian is a nerd. And I have a lot of tattoos as well, too, which you wouldn't be able to see from this audio recording because most of them are on my leg. Yeah, I have oh, one. I got one that's uh, here. It says you can only run the mile you're in. Um, and then I have one on my back. I have one on my stomach. And then I have about 10 on my leg that are all of varying sizes from a being about like five inches across to like two inches across. So there's some still empty real estate down there, which I uh, <laughs> will be getting a new tattoo at a t- tattoo convention I'm going to this summer. But I actually just got a tattoo while I was in Tokyo, too. So that was a fun time. So we love a tattoo. But that's a very chaotic introduction to me. I also love to bring a happy version of chaos with me everywhere that I go. So I I feel like that was accurate, too. So, you know, here we are. Yeah, I love that. You're fun. You've got a lot of interesting things going on. Tell me about your work with the kids. What exactly you do to help them with meals and that kind of thing? Yeah. So here on Cape Cod, we actually have a really prestigious and well-funded, well-known within the schooling industry of children with developmental disabilities called the Riverview School. And it's a boarding school for kids who have developmental challenges, developmental disabilities. And I believe it's, I believe it's like middle school through post-grad high school. And they, these kids can all go stay there. It's a wicked nice facility. And it is just so specialized to them. They're only in classes with other people who have developmental disabilities because you have to have those to stay here at this school. And they do everything together, which is great. But I actually connected with one of the parents of one of the kids who was graduating. And she was like, i really concerned about my son. He's going to be living by himself. And he's actually pretty advanced on the side of children with developmental and adults with developmental disabilities and he's actually living by himself for the most part and has a full-time job which is great and I go in with him and we do meal planning every Sunday and then we go shopping together so that way he can learn a little bit more about what it looks like to make a healthier meal plan kind of troubleshooting skills because one of his biggest disconnects is getting from like the starting point to the finish line It's very big, just like blank space for him between there, which can be a challenge for a lot of us with any kind of neurodiversity is like the breakdown of, okay, I want to go here and I'm standing here. And instead of just looking off into space, I help him break that down and we come up with a plan. 
together. And then we do cooking together every week. We make a new recipe, working on his cooking knife skills, things like that. And then I also just help him as a community support too, because he lives in the same community as I do and just getting him acclimated and things like that. But he's a good kid. That's uh, great. Teaching life skills. That's important. Yeah. So what attracted you to that? I think just because I've really started to try in my dietetic practice, shifting from nursing home care for about eight, nine years. And as many people did who were not only in nursing home care, but any kind of health care during the pandemic, got kind of burnt out. And on the best day, the nursing home system is this unwanted stepchild of the healthcare system. So you can only imagine how during the pandemic that was only amplified up like 5 million percent. And they just, yeah, I, I was just like, I'm, I, I need a mental break. I am so done here with this. But I still was continuing to take on and still am take on clients on the side and like personal clients and things like that. And I've found that over the last two or three years, I've delved more into my own neurodiversity and exploring that a lot more. And being one of, I would say one of my like superpowers more or less is being able to break down complex things into quirky, funny, approachable ways of understanding things, which is very much my style of speaking and also my style of being a nutritionist and a dietitian. And I, I really found that's really helpful for people who are neurodiverse and helps us understand things that are like really complex and really complicated in a way that's like fun, quirky, and uh, also digestible because I get it. And also I get what it's like to try and digest this information that's like really big and hard because I have the same brain. So but I've really leaned into that in what I want to do as a dietitian, just because it's not my main focus anymore. I can be a little bit more picky about the people that I'm taking on and be a little bit more picky about the things that I'm addressing. And it's such a big section of eating that has gone very largely untapped and very largely unaddressed just because eating is such a one dopamine driven activity two sensory activity. And it's one of those things where you don't realize it until someone else points it out for you that you have been in this dopamine lull for the entire day because you feel like you want something and then it ends up just being like a sugary, crunchy snack. And you realize that in the middle of the day and you're like, oh, OK, that's what I, I was looking for that dopamine today. That's what that was. And people forget that. Eating is a tactile and emotional and sensory and stimulation activity as well, too. And you'll get those people who are just, they don't realize they are on the spectrum of neurodiversity and they just can't stop eating. And it, a lot of it is just like they're constant, they're like on a dopamine search and they just yes. can't figure out how to redirect that. And a lot of the times it's like, okay. We don't need to eat all day, but we can find dopamine other places. So let's make a kit of things that we can go and pull from. If we get partway through the day and we realize, oh, I'm on an eating binge today and I physically can't stop myself because oh, I just need a constant rush of dopamine. But you can get it other places. Like go watch a funny YouTube video, like go for a while. other things. We just make a little toolkit, you know. But just addressing that and making that a little bit more something that people are one, thinking about, and two, possibly talking about. So that's kind of where I agree, where I'm and I'm neurodiverse, and I have that issue, too. I used to weigh 300 pounds, mm -hmm. and I've lost 100. So I, I know you. what you're talking about. Thanks. So you were saying that you were quirky, which I love, and you were saying that you were neurodiverse. What neurodiversity do you have? I am very much so in the camp of ADHD. I, I live in that camp very much so. Uh, I, I like to describe my brain as, well, more or less my head, as just full of a bunch of ping pong balls, just constantly being beep, just like bouncing around. And every time one of them hits the outside of the skull of my brain is when I think the thought. But as quickly as it smacks into the side, it's gone. So it's like, boop, boop. and there's like always like five million things happening all at once, which sometimes as a lot of people probably listening, probably know, 
leads to like mental overload and me staring at a wall or what I call walking in a circle and not being able to exit the circle, the circle of death all day long. I'm just <laughs> like, I need to make a decision. Let's make a decision. Let's make it. And then we just never make a decision. And you just end up like staring at a wall half the day. Or it ends up me being like, I am going to be so productive today. And like word vomiting and just having five million ideas. And sometimes it's a good thing. And sometimes that's a bad thing. Sometimes it's like a whatever thing. So yeah, definitely yeah. ADHD, which has been interesting for me because I also have anxiety. And the more I learn about my neurodiversity, and I definitely have OCD as well, but the more I learn about my my ADHD and my neurodiversity, the more I realize that everything I have besides the ADHD is ADHD informed. Like I wake up in the morning anxious and the root of it is, am I going to forget something? What am I doing? What are, what's going on? What am I going to do today? Am I going to forget to do something? It's just like my OCD is is ADHD informed OCD and the th I have systems in place, like places where things go in my apartment, schedules that I follow every day, like little routines, because if I don't do them and I know this about myself, I can easily, if I don't set up my, what if I go on a vacation and I don't immediately set up my medications in an easily accessible spot that I will see before I exit said hotel room or the cottage I was just in when I was in Japan. I will go the entire day without taking any of my medications. And I don't take any ADHD medications just because I have so many other weird other health conditions that I take 10 meds a day already for. And we don't need that. So I just know for a fact that if I don't have these little systems in place, that I will fully forget to do things. And it's not a good idea to forget to do certain things every day. So yeah, the more I learn about my neurodiversity, the more I'm like, oh, yes, everything in my life is ADHD informed issues challenges yeah. so how did you get to this place where you knew you needed to set things up a certain way and more or less i've just kind of always done that and didn't really realize what i was doing and i went through a period where i was like oh my god i'm a freaking like not that there's anything wrong with being ocd but i just went through a period where i was like oh my god am i gonna be that person when they're 60 who puts one drop of coffee in their cup, walks away, has this nonsensical routine around things where I'm not going to be able to walk out the door if I don't put the handle of my coffee cup hanging on a certain draw before I go out the door or something like that, which sometimes my brain does get into those kind of intrusive thoughts where you're like, I can't leave unless I do this one thing or I knock the door five times, things like that. I do get that once in a while. But I, I went through a whole period where I was like, oh my gosh, like that, I'm just, I guess I'm just OCD. What am I going to do about this? Like this guy, I don't know. I'm not that old yet. I'm only like 30. <laughs> what is happening? Uh, I don't know like, what you're talking about though. Cause I went through a time period where I would leave the house mm -hmm. and I would think, did I lock the door? And I well, would that's me every day. drive back and mm -hmm. check the door. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have routines in place because I've lived in the, the apartment I live in now for eight, nine years. I know for a fact that every time I lock the door, I always turn the handle twice just to make sure I have it locked because there have been times where I go out the door and I go to do that and I catch the, the fact that I have not locked it. And I, I'm so terrible. I have a medication where I have to take three, three cups of it. It's a liquid. And you can ask me one cup in how many cups I've taken and I'll be like, I don't know. How many did I? Oh, I have no idea. I literally, I just drank a cup and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't remember literally what I just did three seconds ago. So I have a little tally that I write three little tally checks on a notepad that I have that has my to-do list on it because I can't remember five seconds ago. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's, smart because I have a medication that I have to take weekly mm -hmm. and that is really hard because I yes. think. Did I take it Monday? I was supposed to take it Monday. Did I? I have. I really don't know if I should take it again or not. I have that. Too. So I have one of, I have like an injectable medication. I have Humira that I take for my weird arthritic condition called ankylizing spondylitis. Fancy arthritis, essentially. Eventually I get to turn into the hunchback of Notre Dame. My spine fuses together. I am looking for a chapel to haunt. So if anyone has one, please let me know. I'm on the market. But... Definitely. So they have an app that you can use that lets you track where you injected it because you don't want to inject it in the same place every time because then the skin gets kind of dead and it's not the best. And I also have a reminder on because you have to put it out at least 30 minutes ahead of time out of the fridge on my Alexa 
to put it out every night before. So I have that to remind me to do it. And I have the app that also tells me to take it in the morning and also tells me where I put it last time. Because with yeah. that, I would never remember. Like, like God save us with all these like apps. And I love having my, like my Google Home, like my Amazon stuff and being able to use that or like timers. Timers are great with that too, like setting a timer. Because there's no way, like if I put something in the oven, the number of times I'm either one, put on the timer and forgot to put on the oven, or two, put on the oven and forgot to put on the timer is like not okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, I totally get that. I I don't know what I do without the alarms on my phone either. And the calendar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, I I would totally... I would just be so lost. I don't know. I don't even know. Like I would, I, I would, I would be off in a hole somewhere, just like staring into the ground, being like, "How did I get here?" Yeah, and I would have no I clue. Wonder, I wonder all the time when I use my GPS on my phone to get places. Oh God! I remember yeah. back to the days where I used to have to call my dad and go, "I'm at such and such. How do I get back?" Uh -huh. You know, and I don't know how people did it for so many years with just a map. Oh, I have dyslexia too. And that kind of, for me, definitely one, the ADHD part of it is I can't remember. If you t audibly tell me directions, I might recall the first thing that you told me, but nothing else is going to stick. I'm going to walk to the first place and be okay, I left here. And that's going to be it. Uh, I'm not going to have any idea where I'm going past that. Um, direction sense for me is absolutely hor horrific. And I just, I can't, I can't do it. But yeah, when I was just in Tokyo, if I didn't have Google Maps, I would have been so screwed. Even with Google Maps, I luckily only got lost like three times and it was inside the biggest subway station that is in Tokyo, which arguably is freaking ginormous. So, and it's all layered on top of each other too. So it's hard to, t you, Google Maps can't tell what layer you're on. So that um, was the challenge. But luckily the two or three times I got lost, I wasn't in a rush to get anywhere. So I just kind of was like, Okay, we're going to follow the little circle that says JR15, and we're just going to keep going until we reach it. And that's what we did. And I eventually got all the places I needed to go. But it's just, uh, thank God for Google Maps. Yeah. My God. Yeah, I agree. So I'm very interested in Tokyo. Were you, yeah. you were there to run the marathon, but did you do anything besides that? Yeah. So like I was telling you briefly before, I didn't even know I was going to go to Tokyo until mid-October. And the marathon is on Mar was just on March 3rd. So it's, it's just so funny because I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I'm also a really big Little Mermaid fan. And that's significant because in Tokyo last June, I believe, they just opened up another Harry Potter studio tour, which if anyone is familiar with the one in London where they have a lot of the props and the original seatings and sets and everything and costumes, which I've also been to already. Very cool. I had watched a lot of YouTubers who had gone there and been like, wow, I'll get there eventually. And they're also in Tokyo is Tokyo Disney Sea, which is Tokyo's own like it's it's very different from any Disney park you'll ever go to. It's wicked cool. But there's a whole Little Mermaid's Grotto. That's this whole giant area. And it's got like Ariel's Castle and everything. And again, it's one of those things that I watched a bunch on YouTube and was like, I'll get there eventually when I'm like 55 for everyone's reference. I'm 30. <laughs> Um, so in like 20 years, maybe, because I had, I was like, I, I, don't, I have no idea how to travel to Tokyo. No, not a clue in my life. And so then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I'm going to Tokyo. And <laughs> so all these things that were like weird, random items that were so unattainable to me, I was like, oh, I can go do these things now. Like, this is so cool. So I did run the marathon. I did do some like the cultural spots in Tokyo, like seeing some of the really cool shrines. Also going up and seeing the cityscape of Tokyo, which is so cool because that city is ginormous. And there are so many really cool high up vantage points. Uh, I can send you some pictures later. They're really pretty. Yeah, I would love um, that. But getting to do that. And then I got to do these cool bucket list items that I was like, oh, my God. I don't think I, I didn't think I was ever going to get to do this, like going to Ariel's Grotto in Tokyo Disney Sea, getting to see the Harry Potter Studio Tour, which is only like nine months old now. So it was like. And everything in Japan is so clean and so well maintained. And I miss it so much. I want to go. My favorite thing about Tokyo, I will say, besides like everything else I just mentioned, the thing that I miss the most besides the cleanliness and the cool things that I got to do are the toilets. 
Um, I was going to ask you about their bathroom. Oh my gosh. Like I was so sad when I was in the Tokyo airport coming home because I was like, this is the last time I'm going to sit on a heated because all, all the toilet seats are heated. They're all heated. And they all have this like privacy thing that's motion activated when you sit down of these birds chirping. So you sit down, <laughs> your butt's warmed, you get the birds chirping around you. Everything is clean. It's pristinely clean. And so you sit down and you're just like, ah, and then you know, a nice warm bidet cleans your butt. Like you're in the United States. You're like, oh God, I would never use a yeah. subway bathroom. Pristinely clean, like pristinely clean. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can go get a nice butt bath that's heated <laughs> anytime I want with the little birds chirping at me. And it was so relaxing and so nice. And wow. I miss it very much. The reason I was going to ask this, I actually had a roommate in college. Mm-hmm. She was from Japan, I believe. Oh, God. And, but she would sit on the toilet backwards. Oh, okay. See, I didn't run into that. So you have your Western style toilets, which are the ones that everyone I'm sure is imagining, which were the ones I was describing. But then you also have the Japanese style toilets, which are essentially little troughs in the ground that you squat down and you relieve yourself either way. And I did run into those a little bit. They were a little bit more prominent around the marathon just because I think about 25% of the people who run the Tokyo Marathon are foreigners. So there is a very large population of just general Japanese people who do run the marathon. And it's funny because you have the, a lot of the porta potties were labeled Japanese style or Western style. So <laughs> that way it wasn't a huge shock to your system if you're tired at like mile 23 of a 26.2 race. And you walk in, you walk into a porta potty and there's just like a trough in the, on the ground. Just like, you're like, oh, what do I do with this? Which as someone who has a lot of GI issues and has taken many a poop in the woods, I actually prefer those. What well, it's just easier. Right. But, um, well, that's um, what she said there was back home was the yeah. whole ground. And the, the only reason we knew she sat on it backwards is because we were in a girl's college and when we went in, the toilet seat was up like a guy had been there. Ah, we yeah. were like, uh, why is the toilet seat up? Who was here? And she's like, yeah. that's me. I did that. And we're like, why? And yeah, she explained, it, yeah. Yeah, because that's the yeah. direction that the toilet seat, that the trough toilets are too. You mm-hmm. kind of just like step up to it and kind of like a urinal, you didn't, but instead you just kind of squat and like you do yeah. your business. It's but, interesting um, how different people live. Yeah, it, it it's very interesting. It's also kind of interesting, too, just as someone who, like, one, has a nutritional knowledge, two, has a good scientific knowledge, like, how Western-style toilets really aren't that good for us. And that's why we've seen the advent of like, the squatty potty, more or less. Mm-hmm. And the Japanese people, they're just like, doing it right. They're just like, yeah, we squat. Duh. Like, it's, it's just <laughs> better for your colon health and stuff. It just makes it easier. I'm just like, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah, maybe we should. Americans don't know. We don't know what we're doing. Every time I went over. And this is bathroom related too. So one of the things I also did was I went to see the Harry Potter play called Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It is currently in New York here in the United States, which I've seen it twice there. And there is a Tokyo production of it. It is fully in Japanese. I know the story so well that honestly, I loved it. I thought it was great. (laughs) It's a show to see if you like to see really cool stage magic, because you got to think they have to make you believe that you're seeing actual magic in front of your face on a physical stage in real time. And they do it very well. So... Big props to the whole production side of that show and the theater special effects people are great. And so they give you the standard intermission times, 15 minutes, and it's a packed theater. And they're like, okay, 15 minutes, everyone get back. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go use the bathroom. I've never been through a more efficient bathroom line in my entire life. They had every single woman who wanted to use that bathroom through in 10 minutes. Like we had all used the bathroom, wash our hands. And there was not a line even there when I went back around. I was How like, they, do that? they had a system and they just, they put us all through and we all just like, we used the bathroom and we got out and we used the bathroom and then we got out. And literally it was just by the time I got back from washing my hands and like gone back to where I knew the line had started, there was no one there, not a single human being. Wow. And I, I saw the whole theater get up too. I saw everyone walk out of the theater. Yeah. Speaking as a person who's waited 30 minutes to use the bathroom at a Chiefs game, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. I, I was astonished. I was, I, I got back to where I saw the line had started and the fact that there was not a line at all left. I was like, how is that possible? That's not fair. Like if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have believed you. Like if yeah. you had told me that had happened, I'd be like, no, Juliana, you're freaking lying to me. 
but so, so Juliana, tell me what is the the worst and the best thing about your ADHD? Oh, the worst and the best thing. I think the worst thing probably is just the fact that it makes me kind of paranoid and sometimes it just makes me feel stupid. It's not the fact that I, I don't know. I know that I'm not, but it's just that I'll forget things and it will make me question myself and it will make me be like, oh, why did I forget that? Like, oh, it just makes you self-criticize in a way that's not healthy and isn't helpful at all. And I feel like also in certain settings, specifically like court, more like corporate settings or like work settings, people can be like, oh, there's Juliana. She's like forgetting things again. And they won't, <laughs> they won't let you do certain things if they have a certain predisposition about you. I've had some people I've worked with before who just like, you know, those people who they meet you and they're like, I hate you. Which like, why? And they're just like, I don't know. I just hate you. It's like, okay, great. Cool. Love you too. Hugs <laughs> and kisses. But, uh. Those people just kind of feel like it gives them like uh, it just gives them even more of a reason to be just to be rude to you and just yeah, to do that, things where that's awful. Yeah. What would and you suggest they do to make it easier? I would just find things that make it easier for you to do whatever those processes are that you can't seem to accomplish. Like identify the things because for me, it seems to be like the same thing. Like I'll double book people sometimes and I will be like. Oh. um. I feel so bad. And, uh, and so it's me being like, okay, before I book something in, especially if it's something that like on my end, like I'm going to pay for, or it has someone else who's coming with me or it's someone else I'm like talking to as like a dietitian. I always check, like I, I check my physical calendars too. I have one on my wall and I have one in a planner because I know that if I was doing something at either of those times, I would have written it down in those two spots. And if I can clear those two, I can write this new person in because I think that's just one of my challenges, but finding, I, I guess, identifying what the challenge is that you're trying to overcome and then finding a process that makes it so you can make like a workaround more or less. Right. With, so working with you instead of against you. Yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you have to include any, if there you have people at work who are being rude to you, mean to you, that doesn't even mean you have to include these people in this process in any capacity. Like don't feel like you owe them anything but definitely finding a way to just make it so for your brain it works better because I think a lot of people like myself fail to realize a lot of the time that especially in corporate America but also just generally speaking in like the education world and the broader world it's meant for not neurodiverse not neuro spicy people and those systems that are set up are not conducive to anyone who has any kind of neurodiverse tendencies yeah. and which which is like one is dumb because to think that there are like normal quote unquote people out there and everyone doesn't have one thing that's challenging for them is completely unrealistic and just kind of silly because there have to be there has to be at least one thing that you have a challenge with out there in the world and right. those one or two unicorns out there whose brains are fully neurotypical and nothing is a challenge for them. Good for you. Right. I don't know what that life is like. But so are you an advocate of telling your manager? I am a big advocate of being vocal in general. And this is something you have to become comfortable with. And I, I highly encourage people to just start small with this. But just being vocal about your ADHD or your neurodiverse tendencies in a way that you're not judging yourself for. So if I have something that I'm like, like I'm having like a really like all over the place day or I, I do something either bad or good, I'll just be like, oh, that's my ADHD right there. And I'll just kind of <laughs> say it out loud as like a fact and just be like, yeah, this is just a fact that is happening. Like it doesn't make the situation, it might make things in the moment challenging or it might make things in the moment like kind of fun because one of the things that like is good about ADHD I feel like is that like I can forget things and that means that if something bad happens to me I can forget it and I can move on you know oh that is nice yeah do you say that's the best thing going back to what we asked earlier um I think the best thing honestly is like the creativity just oh, like yeah. I am someone who is very creative like I said I always have like a million ideas happening in my head and I'm I'm very good at like improvisation because my brain is just constantly 
going. So I and I'm very good at just keeping I can talk for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours because my brain will just keep going and going right. and going and going. It was funny when I first started podcasting, like maybe like five years ago, we had one day where one of my co-hosts was like, oh, I can't make it. They're like, Julianne, do you think you can feel like half an hour of talking? I was like, I could talk <laughs> to a wall for seven hours. You don't think I can talk about the thing we already had pre-planned for half an hour? Which again, is funny because me and my co-host and one of my best friends, Jeff, on our podcast, we have the running joke of like neither one of because he has some form of ADHD as well, too. We need, we need the rest know how to shut up. And our biggest challenge is keeping it within a reasonable time frame. Yes, yeah. um, so the podcast I'm running currently is about, I don't know if you've seen the Shadow and Bone Netflix show at all. Um, yes. So that is based off of a set of books that largely is called The Grishaverse. And Shadow and Bone is the first book out of all of those books. And so we are both huge fans of those books. And we're doing a book club style read through of those books we've done the first three and now we're on the fourth one and we read some chapters we talk about them we encourage our listeners to be very active in our community as well too and also jeff and i go off the rails a lot there's a lot of like drag queens involved with this there's a lot of just like crazy random singing we do jeff and juliana's friendship corner it's just kind of like uh also a variety show because again adhd brains together it sounds but, fun. What's it called? Uh, it's called Into the Fold. So, Into the Fold. And, yeah. And we're found any, anywhere you find podcasts, we should be there. But uh, this is neither Jeff nor I's first foray into podcasting. Both of us have done like nerdy Harry Potter podcasting for a while, both been on a huge variety of like either Harry Potter podcast or nerd podcast shows. And this isn't going to be the end for us either. Um, <laughs> And we also do live appearances of our podcast. We have one coming up this summer at Literary Inc., which is a bookish tattoo convention, which is where I'm getting another tattoo. So we're doing a bunch of stuff. Either we have like one panel for our podcast. We're doing a couple other ones about picking out books as an adult, things like that. I'm actually hosting a panel called Nutrition for Nerds, where I'm going to just do like Nutrition 101, but just kind of make it a little more like fun and approachable yeah. for people who are a little bit nerdy like myself. So... So I'm curious, you said that you do the podcast. Mm -hmm. Is that the only place we can find you or are you online or? Um, I'd say the best place to find me is honestly my Instagram. Uh, that's where I kind of base myself out of more or less right now. Uh, just because I, the podcast that Jeff and I have has been going on for, I think we're coming up on three years now. Oh, wow. But I had another podcast that just ended a little over six months ago just because the other host was like, yeah, I, she was just ready to move on. Um, so we, we were like, okay, great. It's been a nice day. We were doing that for three and a half years, but yeah, this isn't the end for me. I'll probably start my own solo podcast at some point, probably a running related podcast at some coming soon. I'm thinking well, that will we'll, be good. Yeah. A few final questions for you. Yes. What, what's your Instagram handle? Yes. It's jelly as in like grape jelly, Anna underscore runs. So jelly oh, Anna okay. underscore runs. Cute. Yeah. And then my my final question, which is a very important question, mm. what tattoo are you getting that? Oh, okay. So right now I'm going to be getting a glitter style chocolate frog box tattoo. So if anyone's familiar with the chocolate frog box from the Harry Potter series, it's that nice like gold and purple box that is just like I that's my favorite design piece from the Harry Potter movies yeah. and everything. So I'll be getting a really cool uh like glitter style i don't have the exact design yet my friend stina is going to be doing it so uh, i'm really awesome. excited yeah yeah so where are you like, getting that uh it's going to be on the back of my leg and it's going to be about like probably about like four or five inches uh like then, diameter yeah. wise and it's probably going to take a little while but see oh, how it goes awesome. i'm excited well, Julianne, I really enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything you want to leave our guests with today? I always like to leave with just a nice little antidote that I have. And it's that it takes the same amount of energy to be mean as it does to be nice. So just maybe choose to be nice today if you can. You know, yeah. you get a lot more out of it. I agree 100%. All right. Well, thank you again, Juliana. You have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you for having me. And that wraps up today's episode of Advancing with Amy, Mental Health Warrior and NeuroSpicy Mama. 
with our incredible guest, Juliana Coughlin. I hope you enjoyed our chat about everything from navigating with Google Maps to the fascinating world of neurodiversity and marathon running. If you want to hear more from Juliana, be sure to listen to her podcast, Into the Fold, which she co-hosts with Jeff, where they dive into Grishaverse books and more. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Don't forget to follow Juliana on Instagram at jelly underscore runs to keep up with her running adventures, see her amazing tattoos, and maybe even catch a sneak peek of that glittery chocolate frog box tattoo she's planning. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to rate, review, and share it with your friends. Your support means the world to us and helps others discover the show. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more episodes of Advancing with Amy, Mental Health Warrior and Neurospicy Mama. Until next time, keep advancing, warriors.